The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'll just say that Charles has been my colleague for several years, and we have worked together on a series of projects involving silent films that are reissued in collections called Treasures from American Film Archives, for which I've been the music curator. And wherever possible, instead of my doing a piano score, I've asked Charles and other members of our section to do their own original scores. So you had an opportunity to see how Peter Child approached that with Skyscraper Symphony. Um, this is another approach altogether and a very different kind of film. Uh, Charles will speak to you mm -hmm. about those issues and then afterward we can have some discussion. Well, hello everybody. It's, it is fun to be here and just sort of being in a in an having an opportunity to talk to you, sort of rather than introducing everybody else and sort of guiding questions and all of that. Uh, and I would like to say it's been a pleasure getting to know those of you who I didn't already know. Um, and um, we're going to look at a particular work of mine today. And we're going to try to formulate a way of looking at in terms of time and music. Uh, and time has been our topic for the class. Uh, and I think one of the things we've taken away from that is how almost overwhelmingly broad the concept of time in music is. What do we mean by time? Uh, and there, there are several ways I want to look at that uh, today. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the film. Um, it is based on a novel by Helen Hunt Jackson called Ramona. Does anyone know the novel? Has anyone read it? It's unlikely. Uh, Fifty years ago, that wouldn't have been the case, in that this was one of the sort of classics of American almost popular literature uh, at the turn of, of the previous century. Jackson was born in 1830, uh, died in 1885. She was born in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, where she was essentially the closest childhood friend of Emily Dickinson and remained in close contact uh, with Dickinson throughout her life. She has an interesting life, and you can sort of, sort of look it up. Um, we won't have time to go into it. But around 1879, um, she came into contact um, with some Native American people uh, from the Osage Nation, then in Kansas, now in Oklahoma. Um, and she became very concerned with the plight of Native people. Um, so she decided to take this on as a cause, rather in the same way that Harriet Beecher Stowe had taken on the cause of abolition, um, particularly through her incredibly important novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which sort of really galvanized abolition as a sort of popular movement rather than a sort of fringe movement in, in the culture. Um, in 1882, she published a work called A Century of Dishonor that was about, it was simply a case-by-case -case study about how uh, various treaties with the American government had been, had been broken and Indian people had been dispossessed. Um, it was not a financial success, but it did receive a lot of attention. Um, she rather cleverly sent a copy of it to each member of the Senate and the Congress. Interestingly, the Senate passed a bill following her recommendations, but it was never passed by the House. Um, however, um, the then President Grant uh, got interested in it and perhaps um, 
this will amuse you. He appointed her a special commissioner of Indian affairs. Uh, and she went out to the West to sort of look into Indian issues. Uh, there's a sense that this was useful because it got this annoying woman who had this cause out of Washington. Uh, so send her away. Um, and in this respect, she became the model for a popular television series. You may remember it from your childhood. It was called Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, uh, who was very vaguely based on Helen Hunt Jackson. Um, in 1884, she publishes a novel based on sort of Indian issues, and that novel is Ramona, and it is an enormous success. Um, it sort of changes the way uh, the nation looks at sort of native rights. Uh, it's also incredibly important in that it turns California particularly Southern California, into a tourist destination. Uh, and in American art historical terms, it's very important in that it brings about a revival of interest in the art and architecture of sort of Spanish colonial era. So every time you see an old style Taco Bell, you know, with the little arch and the bell, remember that this is sort of the legacy of Helen Hunt Jackson. Um, Jackson, of course, dies the year after Ramona uh, was published. Um, but the novel goes into sort of endless republications. Um, it, in about 15 years ago, it became the most successful telenovela in Mexican history. Uh, so Ramona is very much with us. There are Ramona festivals in California. Uh, and it's quite interesting. Uh, Ramona, of course, is the heroine of the novel, and she is a fictional character. But by the 1890s, and particularly by 1900, there is a huge industry in California uh, uh, where people, as tourists, go to visit the locations described in the novel, or at least locations that may be described in the novel. Uh, there's been a lot written about how accurate the descriptions or whether, in fact, Jackson intended a particular place to be um, evoked. But this plays an important role in this film. This film is made in 1910 um, by D.W. Griffin. Uh, and you may know him. He is sort of the great figure in early silent film, or one of the great ones, maybe the greatest. Uh, he's, he sort of develops silent film as a compelling sort of narrative in a way that maybe no one else did before. Um, and one of the fascinating things about this film is it is the first film to have been filmed quote unquote on location in that Griffith takes his actors and camera crews to the actual sites that were presumed to be described in the film. Uh, the ranch that you'll see actually is still a museum to this day, uh, and, and you can visit it if you're in California. But no, no fictional film had ever been sort of filmed um, on the sort of locations that, that the author was writing about before. So it's really important historically about that. It's also one of the very early films of Mary Pickford, one of the greatest of all the silent film uh, actors. Um, so this is sort of an interesting thing to think of in terms of that. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of think about the work in terms of ideas of time. And when I think about time, you know, I mean a number of different things. And time, you know, what time is this piece set in? We, we sometimes talk about time to mean what era is it? I mean, how do we understand when in historical chronological time did this work happen? Um, and that was certainly a major concern of mine in the piece. Well, it's California in the mid-19th century, 
early mid 19th century, just after California has ceased to be a Spanish possession. Curiously, Spanish, well, later Mexican held California, uh, had very careful protections built into the legal code uh, that worked to the favor of Native Americans who were associated with the California missions. Um, when the Americans took over, all of those laws were abolished. Right? So all those protections and sort of enfranchisements for Native people were lost. And Jackson became very sort of concerned about that. And you will see that sort of American settlers are portrayed in an extremely negative light uh, in this film. Sort of ironic because, of course, Griffin later made um, a movie called Birth of a Nation, which has sometimes been seen as celebrating the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. So Griffith is clearly very conflicted about the whole idea of race uh, in America. He can feel threatened by African Americans, but he can sort of have at least a sentimentalized sympathy uh, for Native Americans. Uh, so it's a, it's a complex thing to think about. Anyway, but time is an evocation of era. So I wanted to suggest in a very sort of straightforward way some of the music of uh, Spanish California in that era. So I looked at a lot of sort of folk songs that had been collected from that era. Um, and there's a little dance-like material that opens the film or comes very early in the film. And it just suggests sort of day-to-day -day life in Spanish California. The thing that I was really intrigued to find is the syncopated rhythmic structure of a lot of Latin American music simply played no part uh, in, in the music of, of uh, much of Mexico uh, and its sort of northern provinces. Uh, so it, it's a very sort of Europeanized uh, sort of music. Um, references to the church play a role in it. And for that, I used a music that evoked an even earlier time. Uh, I took a very famous Gregorian chant called the Panja Lingua. Uh, and like a Renaissance composer, I used that uh, to build up a polyphonic piece, a piece of multiple imitative voices that sort of suggests the music of the Renaissance. Because in fact, we know that certain simple kinds of music of this style were part of the California mission tradition. There's also a moment in the piece where our Indian hero sings a serenade. Right? So I needed to come up with music in the style of a serenade, right? music that you sing to the woman you love. Um, and you'll, you'll sort of see how that plays. Um, an interesting character of some of this music, the church music perhaps, but the serenade certainly I think is interesting for us in terms of time in that this is music, the serenade that is, that is being heard by the characters in the movie, right? Um, that's called diegetic, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. But the thing that's interesting about that is it implies that it happens in real time. Right? It's being heard by the characters. So in fact, it's not one of those moments in a movie where time stretches or time compresses, as it so often does. Right? You, know, you see the caption three weeks later. Um, it's not like that. It's actually sort of music that happens in real time. Uh, other kinds of music happen. There's a scene where our hero, Alessandro, Alejandro, rather, uh, goes insane, uh, and we have a sort of very atonal fugue that sort of represents the sort of disintegration of his attachment with reality. Um, just a few other things that you should probably know before we, we look at the film is there are four major characters. There's Ramona. And Ramona is half Indian and half Scottish. 
Um, so she's both white and Indian. Um, she has been raised as the ward of a wealthy California Spanish family. Uh, and part of the movie is about her discovering that, in fact, she is half Native American. Um, the love interest is the um, Indian Alejandro. And he's a really interesting figure in that he is fully Native American, but he has been raised in the California mission environment. Uh, and Jackson talks about him at great length in the novel being a talented violinist. And she sort of talks about him playing essentially um, not only folk music, but sort of European art music in, in church services. So, I decided I wanted each of these uh, characters to be represented by an individual musical instrument. So it became clear that, um, that Alejandro had to be represented by the violin, right, since this is his instrument. Since the character of silent film, an early silent film, there's this sort of wonderful, delicate flickering to the image. I thought an instrument that would most evoke that for Ramona would be the flute. So Ramona's music is usually associated with the flute. Um, the family that Ramona lives with is represented by a, a sort of unpleasant older lady. Uh, she's a grand Spanish lady, and you'll see her wearing a lace mantilla and flounces. She sort of looks like a wedding cake gone bad. Uh, and for her, I used the harpsichord, right? Now, you would think for a Spanish lady, I would choose the guitar. But I didn't. I needed a, an instrument that had some more diverse possibilities. And if you think about the sort of golden age of, of Spanish music, perhaps in the 18th century, with composers like Solar and, and Scarlatti, it's one of the great ages of harpsichord music. So I wanted to evoke that uh, as well. Her son uh, is also in love with Ramona. And while the love is not requited. He, in fact, is a very good, solid, steady fellow uh, with a certain nobility and strength of character. So I thought the cello would be the sort of right instrument to, to represent him. Um, they have their own musical ideas, their own themes that, that recur throughout the piece. And you'll recognize some of them, uh, but I don't think that's sort of the most useful thing to talk about. So that is my take on time as a way of indicating period. Now, I also want to talk in terms of time and how time works for a composer of a film score, the sort of technical mechanics of that. But in fact, I think what we should do first is play the film, and we'll sort of go back and talk about how some of that works. Then finally, I'd like to sort of talk at the very end about a few ideas that might tie this film in with some of the other things we've talked about, particularly Stephen Tapscott's discussion of the California-based uh, photographer, Edward uh, Moybridge. Um, there's some really sort of interesting ties between a film made, um, you know, 15 years after Moybridge, uh, 20, um, and, and we'll sort of sort of look at that a little bit. But anyway, I think we should screen the film. Um, let me let me just add yes, a couple please. things, Charles. Before before we do, I, Charles, really great on um, giving you a lot of ideas about how music can represent the period and also characters. Uh, one thing, since I know we are no longer used to watching silent films, Excellent. Yes, please. Um, there are a couple of things. First, the idea of having a recorded score with the silent film is a modern necessity. But at the, t at the time when these films were originally presented, there was live music. And very often at this period, early silent period, it would have been a keyboard person, a pianist, maybe a small ensemble. But the typical ensemble might have been a trio of a piano, a violin, and a cello, or a piano, a violin, and a clarinet, uh, something like that, or a drummer. 
the quartet idea is represented by Charles' score, but it's an entirely unconventional modern <coughs> quartet. You would never have heard a piano, flute, violin, uh, sorry, p uh, flute, violin, cello, and harpsichord as an accompaniment to a silent film in 1910. It would have been contemporary style classical ensembles that would have tended to dominate in the theater. Right. Secondly, Griffith was a great pioneer, absolutely, and a controversial one. This is very early in his career. He made hundreds and hundreds of short films for about seven years before he moved into feature length films, and that was the history of film narrative. It started with eight to ten minute narratives moved to 16 to 20 minute narratives, what were called two reelers instead of one reelers, gradually the narrative length expanded and Griffith was key to that. This is actually a two reeler. It runs about 16 minutes at a proper projection speed. But that 16 minutes is hard for us to accept because it moves at a different pace and with different editing and film techniques than modern film does. Sometimes it seems slower than necessary, other times it seems choppy and too fast. Part of that choppiness is due to the fact that everybody who saw the film, or maybe 80% of the people who saw the film, or more, might have known the story. So they didn't need all the details filled in for yeah, them. The connecting <laughs> tissue is very much removed. Griffith counts on that, so that he can get, and he wants to get right to the key moments, but even for a 1910 film, which is a very stiff kind of silent filmmaking, there's a dynamism here visually, especially as Charles mentioned, in the use of the locations. It isn't just that he brought the cameras there, but he knew where to put them. And he loves angle shots. Yeah, he doesn't going, want straight on shots, he wants angle shots. In fact, later, I think that's a really important point and we'll come back to it because he reverses some of the ideas that we had seen with Moybridge <coughs> and we'll sort of talk about that. All right, so uh, here we go. Well, probably some questions and ideas to share, especially if, as many people find, they've never seen a silent film before. Um, what's your experience? Any sort of questions or just thoughts about it before we sort of continue our Questions? So, so the, yeah. there, there was a score which comes with a movie and, and something? No, later. no. Uh, there is no survive. In some cases, there were actual published scores for silent films, and you can speak to Professor Marx about this. He's sort of sort of the authority on it. Uh, but usually, they were simply either improvised or assembled from pieces that people knew. Uh, and so, sort of each time you heard the film, in most cases, the music would have been different f for it. Again, there were some published scores, but those tended to come later, didn't they? Yeah. And bigger productions. At this point, uh, there was almost never a score for an American short film. The, the distribution of a score over a large distance would have been impossible, because films, a film like this might have played for a week in a number of theaters all across the country, but it wouldn't have been all at once. It would have moved from one place to another. There wouldn't have been that many copies. Publishers hadn't figured out a way yet to make scores marketable. It wasn't, the industry system was just beginning to take hold in America. Um, and the industry for distribution of music grew with film narratives. So most of it happened later. And actually Griffith was very important for that. He's, he had scores prepared for all of his feature-length films, mm -hmm. starting with Rhythm of Nation. But in this case, it's what we would have heard would have been very different from what Charles wrote. Yeah, I think the only way that I evoked that is for the, the Americans when they're sort of savaging everybody. Uh, I used this sort of um, parody version of Camp Town Races, bum, 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 bum. Uh, and indeed, those kinds of folk or folk-like songs, I mean, it's Stephen Foster, might very well have been in the repertoire of whatever pianist or small ensemble would have accompanied the film. Uh, certainly not in that sort of post-tonal style, um, but yeah, something like if, that. If a film like this, when people would have been playing for a film like this, Spanish, okay? 
they would have gone for the most obvious kind of Spanish music they could have thought of, a Spanish waltz, a Spanish tango, uh, a Spanish popular song, the right. Mexican hat dance, in right. a kind of silliness, but whatever association would have worked. The Indian motif is a little different here from most Westerns because the Indians are Spanish Indians. Uh, well, or, right. I mean, they're, they're culturally in a sort of different place. Yeah. He did. He does. Uh, he doesn't. But if you were going to hear music for Redskins. Oh yeah. You 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 would do. You know. Oh sorry. Right. I mean, you you do pounding fifths in the bass and a little modal melody, uh, stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. A good a good musician might have figured out some way to do that with it. To evoke something vaguely Spanish, you know. Right. Uh, but with the. My stupid brain. Well, right, and absolutely you'd expect that. I just sort of got interested in pushing beyond that a little bit. I mean, when Jackson's talking about, you know, Alessandro playing Haydn masses, uh, you know, it seemed to me that, that we, could, we could suggest that this, in fact, you know, was, an was a culture rather than just this sort of you know, a little bit of exoticism to, to thrill the audience, that you could really play with that. Um, other thoughts and sort of questions? Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. So in creating the score, was it done in, was it made in chronological order, or did you like focus on certain events in the film and then around that? Moment? Actually, I did do it in chronological order. It was composed in chronological order. But that's sort of the next big topic to talk about, and that's sort of like how I put together this film, the score for the film. And you know, the, the issue is how do things line up, right? How does the music synchronize with the film? You know, this is not time as metaphor. This is time as, you know, how are we going to get these things to work? And you can pass a copy of the score around, and you'll notice up above the music, we've got the measure numbers. Oh, sorry, measure numbers below and timings. OK? Uh, and I took a simplistic approach, just because I'm such a mathematical illiterate. And I decided that I would have the quarter note pulse equal 60 throughout, right? Uh, and I also thought that that would give the, you know, some of the music feels much faster and some of the music feels much slower, but the basic pulse is the same throughout the whole film. And I thought in this very sort of fragmentary narrative, in fact, that might be a bonus, right? That that, that was all pretty much the same. So I'll pass this around and you can sort of look at, I wanted to be really, really precise. Yes? Uh, let me explain that those timings that are in the score are keyed to a print that yes, thank you. an electronic DVD file of the film that was given to me using time code. This is how all Right, so I'm watching time code the whole time. This is how all films are. Uh, this is the technology behind all film recording today. You have a time code running right. through the computer. Huge letters down here. Yeah, well, yeah, sorry. And it goes down from hour to minute to second to frames per second. And actually, there's like 29 frames per second, or 29 in a fraction. It's a little off, so right. it gets a little complicated. And you need computer uh, equivalency tables to convert this to musical recording time. Um, so Charles's timings are based on those time code numbers in the film, and when he says uh, quarter note equals 60, what he's doing is making it easier for even the players to look at the screen and not pay so much attention to what's happening as to pay attention to the seconds ticking by, because each tick of a second becomes a, a beat in their score. So that's how synchronization becomes simpler. If you use a multiple of 60, like 90 or 120, right. 
um, you get a, a fairly easy ratio of time to work with as a as a yeah, I want it in a way a, a slower beat uh, because there's a tendency. What's what's the metrotomic marking that I, I learned it, that most most early cartoons were done, and it's faster. It's yeah, 120. So I wanted to avoid this whole sense of that fast. A, a, a tempo. I, I didn't want things to become unintentionally comic, as silent film can and sometimes also, happen. Uh, with Peter's skyscraper symphony, it's closer to 120. Right, right. A, a much later sort of urban film with a lot of different things wanting to evoke. Now, the thing that was interesting is, like I said, I wanted to be incredibly specific, um, and that that was an ambitious thing and. It's, it's a short film. It's like 14 minutes, but it, it took weeks and weeks of work. I could have written a big orchestral piece easily in the same length of time. But what I simply did is I sat at my computer and I looked at it frame by frame, right? And this happens here. The slap happens here in this frame, and it's, you know, 8 minutes, 33 seconds, and a fraction, right? So I'll move it over an eighth note. and. That'll help it line up. Um, so I was trying to be incredibly precise. For me, partly that's because I sort of looked at the film. And when you look at a film frame by frame over and over again, I think maybe any film becomes incredibly fascinating, right? Uh, and I just, it started to feel more and more sort of important as a work of art. And I sort of wanted to celebrate that by being as specific as I could. So it became, for me, almost more like an opera, where the instruments sing. They don't have text, but they have their own characters. And sort of also what happens in this that could sort of never happen in a commercial film, I think, in some ways, is the degree of layerings of simultaneous events. And so much of the last concert was about that. Um, you know, Professor Harris talked about you know, these multiple events happening in musical time in a way that they can't happen elsewhere. And so it was really sort of trying to get at part of that. Um, from, yeah. So, so would, would, you, would you have this? score performed uh, separately from the film? Or? That's an interesting thing. In fact, in the recording studio, and we used Killian Hall, we had the big screen up, and the film was going on behind it with time code, which the musicians couldn't really see, but the conductor could see. Right? Um, yeah. Absolutely. No, well, I mean, I mean, if you remove the film, you know, it's a, it's a piece of music. Would you have it played as yeah. a piece of music? What he's asking. You know, people have asked me about that and have suggested that it was a good idea, but it seems weird to me. It's, it seems hard for me to imagine it without the images, because while I wanted to make very much musical shapes, when and how they happen is completely the product of the visual image. Now, that might, in fact, for lots of people, be satisfying afterwards. M might very well. But it's just hard for me to think of it that way. I, I would certainly, if someone wanted to perform it as a score, I wouldn't forbid that. But I think I'd feel puzzled by it. Um, you know, so really good question. Yeah, Marcus. Well, that same issue came up with the Right. Uh, but we all, we're also dealing with a, with a different situation uh, in that the, uh, it had never been formed. Uh -huh. uh, it was made direct to film. Right. Uh, recorded directly on the film. So yeah, that was, was this, yeah. Line, line up. And so that's a, a very interesting issue to have to deal with. If you uh, want to do this the way silent film were uh, accomplished. Uh, oh, yeah. And maybe not a conductor. You, you already answered that question as to whether or not a conductor was involved. I, I guess a, a conductor looking at a time code would have a, have right. a control of it. Right. <laughs> One hopes. Yeah, so
you know, and we did it in some surprisingly long takes. There are some takes in this that are close to three minutes long. I, you know, they were great musicians. And I was amazed, because you know, I had prepared a score for the conductor saying, OK, well, if we can get this 15 seconds, and then we'll record this 15 seconds. And in fact, it didn't work like that. And we got whole big actual phrases of music, which I think helped enormously. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an in incredible concern, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I had a question about the ending of the film. Uh -huh. I felt like um, the film itself, it just sort of like ends when she sees like the other guy and it kind of like chops right there. Yeah. Like, um, I guess like when you were composing the music, did you feel that it was like almost awkward? Because I feel like most of the time something like fades out and it just... Hugely like, abrupt and there are, there are some experts on this film that think part of it is missing. Uh, because yes, absolutely, it's like, uh, yeah, it feels it feels very abrupt, um, and sort of part of the rules of the project is you weren't allowed to go into overtime, right? You couldn't go into black essentially, uh, other than just just a second or two. Yeah, let's. Yeah, I would like to, to try something there. I'd like to show them the ending without any music, and then show them what you did. Okay. Which, which is really. Really interesting. Okay. Um, so let's. Can you set it up? Yeah, it, it'll just take a sec. You know, while he's doing that, I would also say the thing for me that was an incredible challenge as a composer is none of this is composed in real time, right? You know, I'm setting out my numbers of measures, and in measure 28, on the third, eighth note of the measure, I need something for the slap. Right? So in fact, I'm having to come up with all of the musical phrases, everything in a sort of abstract sense. Right? And in this incredibly slowed down version of time. Chapters? No. Okay. No. So that was sort of the huge challenge. And then I had to basically imagine what it would sound like in real time. Right, because to get that precision, none of it could be could work that way. I mean, I'm used to writing opera, and of course, events happen when I make them happen musically, right? And the character does whatever they have to do at that moment, and then of course this is this is the opposite, right? There's this event that I wanted to take, but so it was a real challenge. It was maybe even a stupid idea, but I was really intrigued by it, or at least a difficult idea. Take a few minutes. Interestingly, the copyright notice, it's the first time that ever happens in a film. Um, Griffith and the company he was working for paid Little and Brown Company, I believe it was $15 for adaptation rights. First time in history a publisher was ever paid for rights to a movie. So there's all sorts of weird reasons why this film is important. Here we've got the end. All right, so uh, you will see at the end an insignia AB in a circle. That's the monogram for the production company American Biograph. Right. Um, you, do you want to s explain what they're looking at? Um, right. So here you've got the very the the scene with Alejandro's Alessandro's body. Um, and these sort of smudge pot things going. And Felipe comes and finds Ramona, and he will then sort of take her off. And actually, in the book, years later, they marry, they have a family, they move back to Mexico. It's all OK. Um, but not here. I'll bring it back just to the beginning of yeah. the sequence. OK. Yeah. 
So that's the end. It goes from there to black after a few seconds. Mm -hmm. I can do it now with music. If I can get, get close to it. Yeah. Right there? Oh, sorry. I go too far. So it is with, with music, sort of a different experience. Uh, certainly, it would be possible to say, well, I liked it better silent. Um, did you, but did you really intend to have a progression have A and B in the middle voices? Actually, no. I did. Do you know? I didn't know that. It is A and B. Uh, yeah, because it's A and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just interested in the fact that Charles managed to bring back the opening material from the oh. beginning of the film well, and, and, <laughs> res and resolve the chord so beautifully. But he had, to, in order to make it work, I mean, if you notice, there was like time standing still during the gunshots with the tremolo, yeah. this moment of yeah. the, and then the galloping, pup, 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 and then a completely changed tempo for the death, for her mourning and Felipe's arrival. And you managed to resolve the final note, the final dissonance just at the end of the AB. Right, yeah. right, right. Um, which, um, th these are the, the details of film scoring that require you to create a form that has no logic other than what you're seeing. Uh, yeah, because the temporal thing simply doesn't mean anything as you're composing that. I mean, you'll watch it over and over again, and you think, OK, well, when it actually happens in real time, it will feel like this, or the phrase will shape like this, or x, y, or z will happen. but. As you're looking at it frame by frame, that seems like a totally remote thing. I mean, I actually ended feel it up pleased with this work, but when I was writing it, I couldn't tell. I could make no judgments of quality whatsoever. I, you know, I'd work like eight hours a day, and I think this is awful. You know, because it's not like music. I mean, we think of music in real time, and even when we compose it, you know, you can sort of play through it in real time, and, and it just sort of wasn't possible to work in the same way. Well, that's, yeah. that's interesting you say that, because there are people, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of Stravinsky, who talked about having the greatest freedom under the greatest restriction. And in what you have in in fact, gun was create a sense of freedom, but working on the very tight. Uh, absolutely, and that was the goal. And I think, in a way, that was why I was so intrigued and so thrilled to get to do the sort of process. It's like, oh, what would it be if you were thinking of music in a way that's sort of uncharacteristic about how maybe one would would normally compose? Uh, and exactly, huge amounts of restriction. You know, this should happen, that should happen. Um, the whole sense of the narrative of the piece is, of course, the narrative of the film, not about. And, and so to, to work with that, I thought, was, was sort of an interesting challenge for me. It was, and I'm, I'm really glad you could see this, because again, this is, a comp this is quite an opposed style of filmmaking to Skyscraper Symphony. And it's obviously an opposed style of music scoring. Um, Peter, in a sense, had a harder challenge because he had a non-narrative film. But precisely because of that, he had an easier time of it because he could impose a shape on that film 
through more purely musical means of rhythmic structures and movement lengths. It was his job to decide, this is a change of feeling. Now I can go into a slow movement. Now I can go into a scherzo. Now I can bring back the opening material in a very classical way. Whereas Charles, he's got to write a serenade in one bit for a minute and 14 and a half seconds. And then he's got to write. It was actually the easiest things. part, but every, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, and it's, it's fascinating how film composers do meet those challenges. Marcus is right, although Stravinsky hated the idea of having to subordinate his music yep. to the visuals on the screen and to the sounds on the screen. For him, dance was a much happier medium because music was the primary motivator force there in time. One thing I would like to say very briefly before we, we quit, it was, it was interesting when we were seeing photographs of Yosemite, right, that Moybridge took with these enormous photographic plates looking up at the mountains. We have a very similar setup at the end of this. The whole idea of the sort of sublimity of the American landscape and being wedded to the idea of violence. That was the whole Tapscott lecture, was about sort of that sublime meeting violence. And that happens here, but it's really interesting. Griffith is incredibly clever because notice the actors are not in the valley floor looking up at Yosemite. They're on the edge of the precipice, right? They could fall off. They could be overwhelmed by that sublime sort of at any moment. Much more modern sort of fragile sense, I think, than some of the heroic qualities of, of Moybridge. But anyway, just something to tie it in with things you were doing yesterday. Any questions before we're done or any sum up? Copeland's whole style is based on the idea of being able to evoke the American landscape in its most sublime aspects. And in fact, his first movie music um, uh, was his first few film scores he took and combined into a suite called Music for Movies in 1942. And the first movement was called New England um, Countryside. And it's all about these kind of craggy Appalachian mountains, but yet yeah, very, very nostalgic mm -hmm. feeling. Perhaps you could have gone in that direction with those mountain vistas, but you had a style going with your themes and your instrumentation. Right, right. It would be hard to make a harpsichord and a shallow and a flute sound sublime there. Well, I, I, yeah. The visuals do that. Yeah, exactly. Let, let them be.